Hi everybody and welcome back to another video. My goodness, it has been a very hectic couple of days with all the leaks coming out and now of course we have Harry the interview with Tom Bradby. This is the interview uh, for ITV and I am going to watch it now. I was considering how to do this the best way, whether to take notes and then do a video. I think the best way is to watch it and then every time there's something that I want to talk about, I'll pause and I'll turn the camera back on and talk to you guys and tell you exactly what I think. So without further ado, let's get to it. He's the most talked about man on the planet. Right, so the first moment I've just had to pause, um, the first question asked was why? And Harry said, obviously, you know, 38 years, um, this is my story to tell. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to tell it. I wouldn't have had this chance in the institution to be able to say it. Again, it's what I've been saying for ages, for ages and ages. Freedom of speech, I 100% believe in. Harry most definitely does have the right to say what he wants to say. But it does also come down to a level of choice. Just because you have the right to say something doesn't necessarily mean that you should say it. And what you do say, there will be implications, there will be repercussions from it. At the moment, from what I can see, and but bearing in mind this actually aired last night, I didn't have a chance to watch it, so I'm watching it now. I've already seen excerpts from it, uh, and also the excerpts that we've had leaked from the book as well. Um, so far, not favourable. Um, so the implications of what he's doing um, if I was Prince Harry, I would most definitely be thinking that it has already been a massive PR mistake. Lots of people are saying, wait for the book, wait until the whole context has been released. I've actually seen some context and I think that the reason why we had two full pages of the book spare uh, about Afghanistan, of course, Harry mentioned killing 25 people, likening them to chess pieces. And people were saying, well, his supporters, ardent supporters were saying, you know, the context, you know, shows it in a different light. I've read the full two pages. The context makes absolutely no difference to the actual excerpt that came out. Um, he has still put himself massively at risk, his family at risk, Megan, the kids, and also his wider family at risk, and pretty much everybody who knows them. Plus, a lot of service people from the UK have been coming out saying it's not the done thing, and it's potentially put an extra threat from the Taliban who actually reacted to Harry's words. So yes, words do have implications and choices are very important. They've reacted um, saying that they also feel extra unsafe because of what Prince Harry has done. Okay, very important thing that Harry has just said, talking about the press. Um, he's just said that he's had six years, the last six years of his life have been dedicated uh, privately behind the scenes, trying to make his family aware, um, you know, about the never complain, never explain, that the press briefings to, to the tabloid media to get stories out. There's been a lot of complaining and explaining has been going on behind the scenes from his point of view. So obviously what happened, what changed his, his position six years ago? Well, of course, that was the introduction of Meghan into his life. So what he's actually indicating here is that um, meeting Meghan, marrying Meghan has, I suppose, opened his eyes to, in his mind, the wrong that has been going on within the royal family. Now, I do not like, and I, I've never endorsed the, I suppose, briefing against other royals. That to me is a no-no. And if I was in charge of the palace, I would be stopping that completely. So I agree with him there. Um, However, I do think that they never complain, never explain, and the way in which they do get information out to try and correct things has worked in the past. Um, Harry obviously is not happy. He thinks that the way it's worked hasn't worked in his favour. Um, and I think that's private issues that need sorting out behind the scenes. And the fact that he thinks that it hasn't been sorted out shows that there is a lot more work to be done behind the scenes. And I don't really think the answer is just to go public with everything. Um, that's not going to help and aid reconciliation. However, I do, I do also think that, like I said, the way that the royals handle these kind of intrigues by slightly briefing the press um, to try and get, you know, palace sources say, snippets of information out to try and correct 
narratives, um, I do think it has worked in the past. And I think now what we're seeing is that Harry has done a lot of public explaining, not just behind the scenes with letting little snippets of, snippets of information go. Um, he's done a lot of very public explain, complaining and now he's, he's having to answer so many questions. And that is why traditionally the palace has done things the way that they have done and are continuing to do so. It's actually a defence mechanism that has probably protected Harry a lot from the, from the past stories. Of course, there were stories in the past about his drug use, wild partying days. And by not really releasing or any public statements about it, it has protected him up until this point where he does have now the choice to put it out there. Um, so the public didn't get to know all the really private personal details. So it has worked in Harry's favour in the past and it now seems that he is rejecting it and rebelling it. And he's indicated that that started six years ago, of course, when he met Meghan. So he's basically saying that Meghan was the catalyst for this change. Um, he just said that he wrote emails and letters. I mean, what's wrong with an actual conversation? I think, you know, a bit, a bit formal, perhaps, to be sending letters and emails about this sort of thing. But he said because things didn't change, he fled his, his home country in fear of his life. Now, again, he's not offering up any information as to what the threat was. I don't think he was really fearing for his life. It just doesn't kind of make sense. He's got royal protection. Well, he had royal protection at the time um, when he, he fled the country. Um, and like I say, he didn't flee the country. He went you know, I remember covering it. I was I was there at the time. Um, you know, I've been covering the Royals on YouTube for probably seven years now, over seven years. And I remember at the time it was agreed, it was arranged uh, that he was going to have a six weeks extended summer break. And so it was already arranged. He didn't flee. It was already publicly announced and arranged. And then what we saw happen was that during that six weeks, they weren't just resting and recuperating um, and just taking stock. They were actually organising their exit or Megxit as it became known. Right, so I've just got to the part where he was talking about how uh, now King Charles, of course, the Prince of Wales at the time, broke the news to, to him as a 13 year old boy in his bedroom that his mother had been injured, seriously injured in a car accident. And he's recalling the time that his father recounted um, calling him darling boy. And that to me shows that, you know, there was a level of affection there. You know, I do know that from the excerpts, he, he does um, mention that his father didn't give him a hug. And I think that's just because Charles is not, he wasn't brought up that way to be a huggy person. Diana was. Uh, she was, you know, younger. She was a little bit more modern, um, a bit more emotional in that sense. Uh, Charles wasn't. He was a little bit emotionally stunted. And, you know, perhaps the notion of giving a hug, perhaps he didn't even really realise that that is what Harry needed at that moment. But Harry has just said that at the time, you know, his father didn't mention the paparazzi, didn't mention the photographs. Who would? What parent is going to tell a 13-year-old boy that the paparazzi were chasing and there was flashing lights? I think Harry is very much holding a grudge against his father for not telling him details that I don't think necessarily a parent would tell a 13-year-old child. It's enough information to take in that their mother has been seriously injured in an accident and passed away. Um, of course, I think he, I think he got told she was in an accident first and then passed away a bit later. But you don't go into, you know, vitriolic detail of how. And to be perfectly honest, Charles at that time, I think that was very, very early in the morning, probably didn't have the full details of what happened. So I think Harry is holding Charles up to a level that, that was never there. Um, if you kind of catch my drift. So I think a little bit unfair levelled at King Charles. Right, so off the back of that, Harry's saying part of the reason why he does he's doing this now is because he doesn't want to end up a single dad. He doesn't want history to repeat itself. That I think people can accept. I mean, and certainly um, he, he has been through a lot from when he was 13. And I think part of his issue 
is that he is still stuck in that moment. There is still inside Harry, that 13 year old boy who was told that his mother had just passed away. And I almost feel that the kind of piece of the puzzle is the hug. It's almost as if as if Charles needs to kind of go back to that moment. It is very emotional. Um, it's almost as if Charles needs to go back to that moment with adult Harry um, and almost give that 13 year old a hug. Um, and maybe that will release Harry and enable him to move forward more. Um, maybe that's what he needs. Okay, right, another thing he's just said is that he felt a level of guilt walking outside the palace, meeting people, shaking their, their wet hands, of course, wet from the tears. Um, and he says that he's kind of put this mental block up. He doesn't have many memories from before um, his mother's accident and, and passing. And he, he describes it as PTSI, post-traumatic stress injury, because he says he's not a person with a disorder, but he does have um, an injury. And that he almost convinced himself that his mother had just gone into hiding and she was going to, you know, reappear one day. She comes to him in his dreams. Um, like I say, it is very... He is, I think, still stuck in that moment, the moment that the walls and the barriers went up and he does need a lot of help to get over that. He said the only time that he cried, uh, really, over his mother's death was at the burial. And of course, the burial is on the on the island. And I think, again, it kind of confirms that Diana, for those doubters that say that Diana is not buried on the island, she is buried on the island, of course she is. It was, it became consecrated ground. It was blessed um, but shortly before before the burial. Um, and there are many people who were there, especially the pole bearers, who actually lowered her into the ground. Um, and there are accounts about about that moment. And Harry obviously was at the burial because the um, I suppose the conspiracy theory uh, is that is that she was actually cremated and put in the family crypt, of which there was there was no room for a burial, and it was Diana's. Um, actual stipulations in her will that she was buried and not cremated so legally they couldn't go against her wishes so yes harry's kind of confirmed she is most definitely on the island okay so harry now explaining about walking behind his mother's coffin he remembers the chinking of the the bridles and, and the hooves and the gravel underfoot and that obviously he recently um, did that walk again for his grandmother the queen's funeral and he made a little joke with with his bro with his brother between them that they already knew the route which is obviously uh, quite a sad thing but he does uh, go on to say uh, that the difference was that with his grandmother she'd lived her life she completed her life and it was more uh, the kind of public mood was more one of a celebration of her life and her her have achieving lived a long life and had a full life a successful life so I think, you know, people can understand that. OK, so Harry recalls that at some point uh, in his life, and he doesn't say quite at what age, uh, he did ask for the photographs, his private secretary, to bring him a file. Um, now, I don't know how the private secretary, secretary got government files. Maybe the palace was actually given its own copy. I'm thinking that was probably what happened. Um, it's non-typical. Normally, you know, government files of uh, police files of that nature would not necessarily be given to the family. But being the position that they were in, perhaps they did have a copy. Perhaps an exception was made. Anyway, Harry claims the private secretary brought him a file of photos um, and information from that night. And he did look at some of the photos. He saw some of the photos of her slumped in the car and it didn't dawn on him at first, but a lot of the flashes and halos of light that were around her were actually from the paparazzi who had caught up with the uh, crash at that moment and they were still taking photographs. Um, and that obviously haunts him and has shaped, helped to shape um, his opinion and view of the media from that point onwards. Um, so I would also like to point out, that, like I said, we don't know what age Harry was when he asked for that information and was actually shown it. Um, some people are thinking it was when he was, you know, 12, 13. Um, I don't think so. I don't think he would have asked for them at that age. I think um, it would have been years later, maybe 
early adulthood, I think, would have been uh, a time when he, he may, and William, of course, may have asked for that information. Okay. He also says that um, Jamie, I think it's Jamie uh, Pinkerton, Pinkerton, I think it is he, he's referring to, um, didn't obscured the more graphic elements from him. Uh, I think Harry wanted to see it, but later he was uh, grateful that he didn't actually get to see uh, the more graphic photographs and details. He goes on to say that he wanted to see this information and these photographs um, to actually feel some pain because he was still numb. He wanted to feel the hurt because he wasn't feeling anything. And also he wanted to confirm uh, that it did actually happen because there was this level of disbelief. It's all it's all very sad, really, when you think about it. Um, it's actually quite harrowing. Um, Harry, we now got to the part where Harry um, was in his 20s and he asked to be, he was asked to be driven through the tunnel uh, where his mother lost her life um, at 65 miles an hour. He um, also confirms that William asked for the same thing, but on a separate occasion, um, unbeknownst to each other at the time. Um, Harry said he wouldn't have been able to have coped with that any earlier, but as he was there for the World Cup, um, he did ask that and he believes that no one should have died in that tunnel, it's a pretty nondescript, uh, average tunnel. Nothing, nothing um, of note about it. Um, he does say that during the inquest, William and Harry were sat down, and they were told that the chain of events was like a bicycle chain. If you remove just one of the links, including the paparazzi, uh, then the end result um, would not have been the same. They were trying to work out where the paparazzi fitted into it. I've always tended to think of it more as a fixed point in time and that all the different variables that contribute to that link chain if that was always a fixed point in, in time and all the events were going to happen um, what was the factor that would have um, I suppose changed the end result and for me it's always boiled down to the seat belt during the inquest all the different medical reports showed that had Diana been wearing her seatbelt, she may well have been injured, but she wouldn't have lost her life. Um, so even if you, you take out, you know, different elements, um, even if you can't take them out, and this was a fixed point in time, it was always going to happen, really, the factor that would have saved her life would have been the seatbelt. And I hope Harry also realises that. Right, so we've now moved on in the interview away from uh, his mother and now towards, I suppose, happier memories. And Harry's kind of indicated that writing the book has been very cathartic and actually helped to get back some of those memories that he has suppressed. For example, uh, you know, teaching um, the, his great-grandmother, of course, the, the Queen Mother, the kind of Ali G flick, I can't do it, the flick of the wrist, and that she had a, an amazing flick of the wrist. He says he felt at that time more part of the family and he realised sort of then and now the relationship between his father and the Queen Mother. I mean, we all knew that they had this kind of special relationship because the Queen herself was away a lot uh, when Charles was young, so he would stay with his grandmother, the Queen Mother, and they had this kind of special bond. And that at that time, Harry felt very much more part of the family rather than being isolated as he had felt previously. Right, we've now got onto a bit where Harry's talking about kind of like, I suppose, the intentions of the book and love for for his father. He says he does love his father. Uh, when challenged, he kind of admitted that some people don't love their father, so it's not always completely obvious. But he says he really does love his father, he loves his family, and that anything he's done has not been um, to intentionally hurt them. Um, however, I can't... I can't get my head around that. I really can't because there are so many hurtful things that we've already seen. Even the book isn't even out, and we've seen hurtful things: barbs, uh, flamethrowers, basically aimed at certain family members. William, in particular, gets gets hit. His father, um, Camilla. Um, so, so yes, I think there have been hurtful things in there, and the only reason why he would put them in, I think, is to hurt because otherwise, why would you put them in? Even if it is your truth, like I said at the start 
uh, your words have implications. And the implications of those words, which Harry will know, is that certain people will be hurt by them. So he must have known when he was putting them in that these things were going to hurt. So I would challenge him further on that point. OK, Harry now talking about choices um, and decisions. And he says that uh, members of his family have chosen to get in bed with the devil, so to speak, um, and have tried to rehabilitate their image. I mean, we know, for example, I think he may be referencing Camilla, for instance. You know, we know that back in the early days um, of post Diana's death, that there was a rehabilitation of Camilla's image because it had been shot down so much in the media. So there was a spin doctor hired um, and, you know, her her media image was tried to be carefully reconstructed. And that has taken many, 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 many years, but not actually ne necessarily to do with the reconstruction of from what the spin doctor did. Actually, it's just because she's got on with, with life. She's knuckled down. She's done her duty. She hasn't spoken out. Uh, and I think that in itself has earned the most respect. Um, from the public. But Harry's going on about, you know, choices, but I also think he needs to look, as I've said previously, at his own choices. Right, so Harry's also, like, he's, he's so, at the moment, it's very hypocritical. He's kind of said that, okay, they can do that, but when it's at the detriment of other family members, that's where I draw the line. But I would say that what he's doing here is at the detriment of other family members. So he's he's not practising what he's preaching. OK, so Harry also sort of referencing um, his father, I suppose, not really being ready for parenthood. I mean, who who is? But in terms of the time, uh, the commitment, the emotional needs, perhaps, you know, Charles wasn't ready to have children. Um, but also that he really wasn't ready to be a single parent and he says that Charles would accept this and that overnight uh, at dinner one night at, at Highgrove he doesn't indicate when uh, but I'm assuming perhaps in his 20s maybe even you know early 30s um, that he spoke about his mental health issues and then after he'd explained all the different things that had been going on that uh, his father said you know you know I suppose it's my fault and he sort of apologised and Harry was quite happy, or, you know, accepted sort of that apology and that recognition. Um, so I suppose we have to take that at face value. OK, Harry now talking about, um, I suppose, his family's relationship and that he, he understands the fact that they need to have uh, or that they want accept this relationship with the media. Um, Harry doesn't um, agree with it, but he accepts that that relation, that symbiotic relationship, I suppose, that we all know about, kind of has to almost exist. However, Harry says um, that when he moved away, that the institution and the press doubled down on him. And I suppose when Meghan tried to tell her story, they just sort of doubled down even more. Um, I mean, I don't think every member of the family kind of has that relationship with the press. For example, Princess Anne is a shining example. She doesn't care. She doesn't care if she's in the papers. She doesn't care if she's getting the publicity. She really does not care about the glory. She just does her engagements. If they get attention, they get attention. If they don't, they don't. And I think that is an example of a really healthy relationship with the press and an attitude to have. The Duke of Edinburgh had the same attitude. And to be perfectly honest, that is the sort of thing that Harry needs to be, uh, I suppose, looking at as a way forward. Just not, don't care what the press think, what they say, if they're paying you attention or not. I think what Harry is indicating is that actually, probably himself and other members of the family, perhaps a little bit higher up in the line of succession, really do need or feel the need to have that attention, that adoration, um, but you, I think he fails to see that, you know, that it is this symbiotic, I don't think he really does understand this symbiotic relationship, that in this kind of free press society, this sort of world, um, you need to give and take. There is this sort of give and take, and Harry at the moment and Meghan seem to, all they want to be doing is taking, having their cake and eating it, uh, and not necessarily 
doing anything on, on the press's terms. It is symbiotic. I think William and Catherine have actually got this relationship right at the moment. You know, I've never seen, for example, a paparazzi photograph of George or Louis or Charlotte being dropped off at school by, by Catherine or William. I have seen pictures of Diana dropping William and Harry off at school. So things have changed post-Diana. I'm not saying that there aren't paparazzi, that there's not a level of interest, but certainly what gets to print um, is, is very, very different. There is a different attitude. It has changed uh, from what it was in Diana's day. So we've now moved on to, I suppose, talk of Camilla, the fact that some private conversations with William that she had uh, were leaked. Now, I, I did hear from a palace source, uh, which I imagine is the palace kind of hitting back at these claims that Camilla leaked uh, these these details. Um, Harry says that the only other person present was William, but I imagine that there were discussions um, after having these meetings. You know, Camilla, you know, it's not like a, a private audience between the monarch and the prime minister where, you know, no side reveals or is supposed to reveal uh, of what each other said. I imagine that Camilla would have told Charles, perhaps would have told, you know, Charles with uh, maybe perhaps even staff members in the room, private secretaries, etc, etc, what had happened during those meetings. So it, it, they've kind of indicated that it wasn't Camilla, that it was actually someone who who had heard that conversation, not necessarily with a view of it being leaked to the press, um, but just that she'd had conversations uh, with other people present and it, it wasn't her directly that, for example, had gone to lunch with a journalist and, you know, told all of that information. Harry made one important little um, comment. I don't know whether other people picked up on it, but he says it happened in the past and it's still, you know, there's still things happening um, now. Let me just wind back and I'll, I'll get his words exactly. Okay, so he said that there are things that have happened in the past that have been hurtful. He said some in the past and some current. That's how he, he gesticulated. Um, I'm wondering whether or not he's meaning um, the, I suppose, the conversation that Harry and Meghan revealed in the Oprah interview about Archie's skin colour. Um, is he actually meaning that Camilla made that remark and that's what's been hurtful mm, recently. Because I've heard things, and it may even be coming up in here, um, that he's never ever going to reveal who that person is. Um, but perhaps he was, perhaps he did slightly reveal it there. Maybe it was Camilla. Okay, so I just watched, I suppose, a quite an important chunk of, of the interview where he talks about uh, his father and Camilla being in love that he and William didn't want them to get married, but his father chose to. He acknowledges that they are very happy together and that he himself is very happy for them uh, being together. You know, he does accept her as his stepmother, um, even though initially they probably didn't want them to actually get married, but he was very happy for them on that day. He says that he does want his brother back, he does want his father back, he does want reconciliation but they probably don't recognise him at the moment and he certainly doesn't recognise them. So I think it just shows this big mismatch. Um, they don't understand each other. He, Harry said it, I, I probably agree. They probably don't. Uh, they're not on the same page. You know, if there was a book, then, you know, Harry's on page one, they're on page 27. You know, it's, it is completely... They are totally, at the moment, at odds with each other. They do not understand each other. They do not see things from the same perspective. Um, and I don't know how Harry thinks that this is going to go any way towards reconciliation. I think it's only going to drive a deeper wedge between all of them. OK, I think Harry, again, kind of referencing the air and the spare, um, sort of showing that William's already winning in life. He says how he's married, you know, all the rest of it. Harry's still living with his father, eating takeaways. And I think that just goes to show that there was a certain amount of competition between the brothers, um, you know, seeing it as winning or losing. Uh, I think Harry saw William being ahead. Um, and perhaps there was a little bit of sibling jealousy there. Perhaps Harry's kind of indicating that he did want a slice of what William had, the kind of family life, um, 
And yeah, I, I think that most definitely plays into this air and spare part. But I think that isn't just about the air and the spare. That happens in a lot of families between siblings, you know, all that kind of thing. There is this kind of competition between even the people that you know, your, your neighbours, you know, one-upmanship one up with the Joneses next door. They've got a new car, therefore you feel that you should be having a new car. And if you haven't got one, that you're not winning at life. So I think this, I recognise this, you know, in in the wider world. I don't think it's just to do with the air and the spare. And then perhaps Harry's kind of equating this to his position, and I just don't think that is there. Shocking or surprising to people is that after our mother died, we were on different paths. Okay, so Harry, again, sort of indicating that he loves his brother, but he now understands that kind of sibling, the older sibling role. He recognises it in his own children, Archie and Lily, who roughly have the same kind of age gap uh, Archie wanting his own space, Lily trying to always be uh, with with Archie and of course he likens that to when they were at Eton, uh, William having been there a few years before Harry, Harry got there, not really wanting to know him at Eton and Harry sort of sat there wondering, wondering why. Um, so yeah, I think he's kind of realising that that is a normal part of siblings in general. Right, so Harry kind of talking about uh, his relationship with Kate now, of course, the Princess of Wales, uh, saying that he did consider, he does consider her a bit like, uh, a bit like a, the sister that he never had. And he did feel a bit like the spare wheel as part of the royal trio. But he wanted uh, whoever his future wife would be for them to work very much alongside William and Catherine. Um, and he hoped that that would happen uh, with Meghan, but he says that because lots of uh, non-typical things uh, about Meghan in terms of, you know, not being a, the traditional royal bride, she's American, uh, she was an actress, uh, biracial, all these different elements have stereotypes and he believed that those stereotypes came into play uh, in the minds of his wider family, but also William and Catherine in terms of not fully accepting her into the family. Now, I remember this in terms of what outwardly was expressed in the media as not necessarily being the case. I remember Meghan being welcomed very much into the family, more so than than any, um, you know, English, white, uh, non-actress, virginal bride that had come to the royal family in the past. Um, you know, Meghan was independently wealthy and successful in suits. William and Catherine, it turns out, watched suits. I remember uh, Meghan going on, you know, a little tour of the UK, introducing her to the UK uh, with Harry pre-marriage. There was like a pre-marriage tour. I covered it all on this channel. No other bride that's married in has ever got that. I think the royal family very much saw Meghan as being this kind of oven-ready royal. You know, she she was a good orator. She was educated. Uh, you know, she 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 had she was confident. She was a almost able to just get up and go and kind of hit the ground running. And she was given things um, that no other royal bride coming in had been given previously. You know, Catherine had to wait until she was married before she did. You know, an engagement, so to speak. Um, it was different for Meghan. So. What he's saying in in terms of maybe the internal acceptance was definitely not what we were getting on the outside because all we saw was a very welcoming family that was demonstrably uh, welcome because of what we were seeing. She was given more things, uh, given more leeway, given more freedom than any other um, bride, future bride, fiance marrying into the family that had gone before her. So Harry recalling the kind of bridesmaids incident over who made who cry. Um, again, he is sticking by the fact that Meghan uh, was the one who cried and then Kate came around and apologised. Um, from what I understand from all the different kind of accounts, they probably both ended up crying, you know, Meghan because, you know, she was kind of rebuffed about the whole baby brain thing. Um, and then Catherine, because she was called the kind of baby brain thing. So I think kind of the cause and effect, you know, I think both of them ended up being very upset. Catherine, you know, probably just took the hit and came round and apologised the next day, which of course improved relationships 
between the two women. Um, Harry kind of saying that he didn't necessarily want the palace to put out um, that the roles were reversed in a statement. He just wanted them to put out a statement saying this didn't happen. But I do remember, you know, going back to it all, the moment you start, you know, really, I suppose, putting statements out about every single story, the more stories, perhaps even untrue stories, they're going to put out there just to get a reaction. Harry, I mean, the, the one story, though, that I really have no idea why on earth they even commented on was the whole Botox thing. Catherine was rumoured to have had, had Botox. The palace did put out a statement saying it wasn't true. I have no idea, really, because that was a really silly thing. You know, they may as well have just completely left that one. So some of the trivial stories that Harry is referring to, again, I, I, I do agree. Perhaps they shouldn't have commented on. But I think with something that was a bigger story like this, the press then, if, if the palace would have put out a statement saying, no, it didn't happen, um, I think the press obviously knew that it had. Um, perhaps it was because it was a leak. I don't know. So it perhaps would have raised more questions than what it would have answered and it would have come across as a lie because, of course, it did happen. So Harry was kind of asking them to lie. Um, so I think the palace was in between a bit of a rock and a hard place. Do we lie to the press or do we correct the story um, in its entirety and then open it up to more criticism, to more questions? OK, we're now on to Beardgate. But I, I confess I'd never heard this story. Perhaps it's something that's only just come out um, in the book. It's one of those leaked stories that I haven't managed to cover yet. But apparently there was a big furore over whether Harry should shave his beard. Apparently his grandmother um, and William wanted him to shave his beard for his wedding to Meghan. Um, and William was apparently made to shave his and Harry was very defensive and protective about his own beard. Um, now, from this kind of point of view, I can understand because I do have one. I wouldn't have wanted to have shaved mine off, uh, you know, other, other than if I decide I want to shave it off. Um, so Harry says he grew it at a time as a kind of a, a new Harry, uh, but also perhaps a bit of a shield, um, almost like he's kind of hiding behind his beard, but also that it represents a new version of him. Plus... Megan met him with a beard, so he was worried about walking up the aisle and Megan not, you know, not recognising him as the same version of Harry. Anyway, Harry sort of explained that to his grandmother. Um, that I suppose it, it was a bit of an emotional crutch. And I think she accepted that. But then he had a massive argument with William that lasted a whole, a whole week. Uh, William really wanted him to do it and he sort of ordered him as the heir to the spare to order it to shave it off. Um, Harry didn't. Um, and yeah, he, he thinks it, it's all because kind of William was sort of made to uh, as the heir. Um, so yeah, just Beardgate. I mean, my goodness. I don't know. OK, I just had to pause this section. So Harry talking about the Fab Four again, that it was something that he hoped would happen, but didn't kind of play out. Um, and he kind of admits that in every palace, in every royal home, the newspapers are spread out, that the royal family most definitely do read the press about them. I imagine they even Google themselves. Maybe even they've rocked, watched some of my videos in, in the past. I don't know. Uh, I mean, certainly one story that I think that came out in spare, I read an anecdote, uh, was about um, Edward and Wallace being buried further away at Frogmore from the rest of the family. Maybe the Queen had done that uh, to kind of exile them in, in death as they were treated in life. I actually made a video on that years and years and years ago. Perhaps Harry watched that video. Um, I don't know, but that was that was a video that I made, for example. So, you know, you never know whether or not they're actually watching you. They they may even be. Um, so I hope I'm giving a very kind of fair and balanced <laughs> review of, of what's going on. Anyway, um, Harry reveals that the kind of hierarchy structure of the monarchy as the spare, he felt he wasn't going to be any competition for sort of William and, and, and Charles. But he does say, and kind of, I suppose there were lots of negative stories. I mean, people have said that William and Catherine, especially Catherine, got a lot of stick from the media kind of in the early days of, you know, I suppose their relationship, uh, the whole weighty Katie thing. And then, of course, 
when they first got married. Although when they first got married, I remember a lot of support, but there were also stories coming out. So Harry indicates that a lot of um, the stuff that he and Meghan were getting did also happen to William and Catherine. He thought that that was not going to happen to him, that he didn't crave the limelight. Although to be fair, you know, if you don't crave the limelight in the royal family, you do what the Wessexes do, you do what Princess Anne does, you just quietly get on with things. You don't over-publicise, um, you know, you, you, you don't kind of put your head above the parapet for that kind of level of global attention. Princess Anne does everything low-key, doesn't really publicise visits, just kind of turns up. Only the key people that need to know, know. She turns up, she does her work. If press happened to be there, local press, national press, whatever, she's fine with that, just gets on with it. So I disagree in the fact that they didn't necessarily want um, attention. Uh, of course, they wanted attention for their projects and what they were doing to get out there. Um, and I think they must have known. I think it would have been very naive to not have known sort of, you know, new newly married couples on the block are going to get a lot of attention, that there are going to be comparisons between wives. It was done in the past with Diana and, of course, um, the Duchess of York. So I think they knew that was going to happen. And I always I always thought, reporting on this, that that would die down in time, in enough time. Uh, and I still, to this day, don't think that Harry and Meghan gave it quite enough time to settle down. I think if they'd have just done six to eight months of just really boring, I say boring, uh, you know, opening hospitals and whatever, sort of low-key work, charity events, turning up at school fates, that kind of thing. I think the press attention would have levelled off and it would have kind of peaked and then kind of, you know, fizzled a little. Um, but by the very nature of the work and the, the scale of the, you know, the tours that they were undertaking, for example, uh, that was always going to garner a lot of press attention. And to think otherwise, I think, is a little bit naive. OK, so Harry's just spoken about the whole dog bowl incident. I have spoken about that in previous uh, videos, so I'm not going to go into great lengths and depth about that. The one thing I have learned from the interview is that rather than leaving Nottingham Cottage, um, William actually went into the other room. Harry stayed in the kitchen. Uh, William went into the living room. Two minutes passed. Harry got up, William was still there. That's when he said, don't tell Meg. Um, and then Harry asked, of course, asked him to leave. Um, so I just thought I'd kind of, I suppose, clarify that. Um, Harry also talks about this kind of red mist. He recognised the same red mist in William, but his own kind of counselling and whatever has enabled him to be in a better place. Therefore, that's why he didn't fight back. Um, yeah, and that's kind of, I suppose, where we've got to on that whole incident but that has been spoken about at great length by myself and of course um all over the place okay so of course harry now talking about the secret code that, that he had between himself and his brother on mummy's life and of course william used that uh, at the duke of edinburgh's funeral to try and i suppose make harry understand that he loved him and he wanted the best for him he wanted harry to be happy harry just said that what was shocked him the most wasn't that he that, that those uh, that secret code was used, but that he didn't believe him. He didn't actually believe what William was saying. And I'm about to watch, I suppose, why he thought that. Oh my goodness! So Harry's just said that. Well, he was just asked what he thought William and his father would make of this interview. He said he didn't doesn't think they're going to read the book, although he'd hope that they would. He doesn't think they're going to watch the interview, but again, he hopes they would. Um, he says that. He's not going to sort of say what he thinks William would say, but he would like to have conversations uh, and he would like those conversations to remain private. I think the whole way of doing the interviews and the book and the Netflix and the Oprah, where he's recalled conversations and spoken about things that happened in private, the trust has gone. Um, I don't think he's really understanding that by doing this, it's the trust has completely gone. That has broken down. So... Are William and Charles going to have the sort of conversation, private conversation, that he wants to have and be confident that that private conversation will remain private? I think Harry has completely contradicted himself in what he's saying and what he's doing are two very, very, very different things. 
Okay, so Harry's just said, um, you know, that the, it's all about the leakings and he keeps talking about all the leakings and the press leakings. Like I said, some of it, you know, would have been to protect him back in the earlier days. And he wants to concentrate on the last six years. He said that there was a notion, you know, a narrative that he wanted to leave to go and make money, um, whereas he wants to do a life to continue a lifetime of service and duty. And that's what he's demonstrated. I mean... He kind of hasn't. I mean, the amount of actual charity work that Archwell has done during the last sort of, you know, two to three years has not been that great. It certainly hasn't been the amount that he would have achieved if he'd remained in the royal family as a working member. Um, and, you know, a lot of the really high profile things, the money making side of Archwell, let's not forget there's Archwell Audio, Archwell Productions and Archwell the, the Charity, all three very different entities with very similar names. So don't be fooled into thinking that they are all for charity. Um, the productions and the audio are very, very much their own vehicle for making money. And all of the big things that they've concentrated their efforts in hasn't been charity work. It's been Oprah, it's been Netflix, it's been his book. Um, of course, they have had other projects along the way. Um, but all the big kind of set piece projects, the ones that make money for them, have been, you know, things like this, um, promoting the book, which, you know, he's supposedly had a very large advance, the Netflix deal. Um, so... I would kind of say, you know, no, what you've demonstrated since leaving is not just a life of service and duty. You've also demonstrated the whole money making thing. And you've put a lot, I'd say, probably more effort into those things than what he has uh, with the charitable endeavours. OK, but I do have a cat tail on me. So um, Harry's just said that his family has shown no, I suppose, no want willingness to reconcile um, but over the past few days, palace sources have said that actually that's not true, that Harry was, and Meghan were, and Archie and Lilibet were invited to Christmas at Sandringham this year. And of course, they turned it down. So I would probably say that that was an invitation, an open invitation for reconciliation, at least, you know, for them to be there and be part of the family. Of course, the late Queen, um, you know, did often refer to them in, in statements as valued uh, members of the family. And I think that has extended from uh, from King Charles, now of course that he's king. So, you know, if they are invited to things, if there are open invitations and they turn those down, which of course are opportunities to reconcile, then they are also being part of the ongoing problem, I suppose. OK, so I suppose Harry's just made a good point, which I think one is one that a lot of people have been making um, ever since he left. I think he left thinking that the level of scrutiny um, wouldn't be there once he'd left the UK. And he's just kind of conceded that that level of scrutiny continued and has continued even to this day. So stepping back and moving away hasn't actually changed, I suppose, the level of press intrusion, the stories that are being written about them and one thing that I've said for a very long time is that you almost have to be in, within the institution to try and make any lasting changes and by removing yourself um, and then alienating yourself further from your family, um, driving a further wedge, doing all the media things to try and make the money to sustain your lifestyle, um, I, I don't think it's working and Harry has almost kind of alluded to that. I, I don't think he actually thinks that, um, but I, I don't think that it's made anything any better. And I think in time, he will really begin to understand that. Okay, so Harry's just said, um, if he can't serve his country from in the UK, uh, one of the reasons being lack of security. Now, of course, he's got his own funded security in the US. I kind of, I don't understand why the threat is bigger in the UK than what it is in the US. That's one thing that I would kind of like a little bit of clarity on. I'm hoping the interview goes into that a little bit further. Um, but we know, you know, that, that Harry doesn't have at the moment the police protection um, here in the UK, but he's funding his own in the US. So if he feels safe in the US, why wouldn't he necessarily uh, feel safe in the UK? Is it because his personal protection perhaps wouldn't be able to carry guns? 
Um, maybe that's sort of one reason. Is it, I suppose, the shared intelligence? Uh, but then do, do the American security have access to state intelligence as well? Um, it's all a little bit confusing. Um, yeah, so Harry, obviously, he's still is still embroiled in that ongoing quest to get back the security. Did Harry speak about the Taliban and how many people he killed whilst in the Afghan war to try and up his threat level so that he would be able to have more of a sway to get that security back? Did he actually try and make himself more of a risk? I think I actually just heard Harry um, say that they haven't said anything to kind of incite negative stories since moving away in 2020. Um, the Oprah interview, I mean, <laughs> you know, they have baited the media, I suppose, from doing interviews such as, as that. And then obviously there were rumours about making the Netflix series. So I, I don't really think that they just sort of, you know, sat quietly since 2020 and didn't say anything. Um, other than just do their charity work. I I don't I don't see that in reality, in practice. Okay, so Harry then went on to reference the Jeremy Clarkson article. Um, he says that obviously he felt hurt, upset, it was disgusting, aimed at his wife. He also went on to quote um Camilla, because Camilla does a lot of work um with for sort of, you know, I suppose um women's women's rights and uh female abuse. Um and he says that the palace silence on this is, I suppose, deafening. Um, what I would say is that the palace does technically tend to stay away from things that could be seen as political. Now, I know that some other people may be seeing these things more as humanitarian, as more social. And like I said, Camilla does do lots of uh, work in this field herself. But to speak about something... Um, on the level of trying to affect political change directly, you know, challenging uh, maybe laws or regulations or even challenging a free press, um, it's not the royal family's, the institution's position to do that because then they would be accused of, I suppose, trying to control the press, even though in their own way they have been, but they've been trying to control the press through, I suppose, these little series of leaks to try and correct narratives. Um, so like I said, it is very symbiotic, it is very nuanced, and I think Harry just wants the press to kind of, you know, play ball, only write positive things, never say anything negative, never criticise, and it's just not going to work that way. There does need to be, I suppose, this balance. And I go back to, you need to be in the institution to be able to almost try and to affect that change. Okay, so Harry speaking about Lady Susan Hussey and the Ngozi Fulani um, incident that happened. He says it's really good that I suppose the palace invited her back in um, and sort of accepted that level of accountability. He says that he and Meghan both love Lady Susan Hussey and they know that there was nothing meant by what she was saying to Ngozi Fulani. They do believe that it was this kind of big misunderstanding and that's Harry and Meghan saying it. So... Um, so yes, I think it's it's turning out that I think Lady Susan Hussey was kind of made a bit of a palace scapegoat. But Harry is kind of happy that the palace invited Ngozi Fulani back to uh, to speak to Lady Susan Hussey. But I do think that Lady Susan Hussey was, I suppose, made a bit of a scapegoat. Should she, you know, take back her role uh, in the palace? Should she be offered it back? Um, you know, who, who knows? Only time will tell. But she was, you know, or has always been um, a very dedicated uh, former lady-in-waiting to Her Majesty, Her Late Majesty, the Queen. OK, so Harry has been talking about um, the unconscious bias that exists within the royal family. And he said that he's never called them racist during the Oprah interview, but he has called out unconscious bias. And he said that if unconscious bias isn't recognised, um, then, and I suppose, addressed, then it can turn into racism, uh, of which I'm thinking he's indicating that it hasn't been addressed. However, he has said he'll never reveal the name of the person um, that he's alleging 
has made those remarks. Although at the same time, we never know whether or not that person has addressed anything. He's also said that these kinds of conversations do go on in families all over the world. Um, but he's quite clearly categorically said that the royal family is not racist. And of course, he's let, I suppose, the narrative be that he thought the royal family were racist off the back of the Oprah interview for two years straight without addressing this. Um, he's waited, obviously, until something that's that's been monetized, i.e. the book. Um, do you remember when William was asked by the media, are you, um, is the royal family a racist family? And William, of course, said, said, no, we are very much not a racist family. So if Harry knew that from the Oprah interview, people didn't understand what he was saying, people have thought that he's been accusing the royal family of being a racist institution, a racist family. And now it's taken two years for him to correct the narrative. So, you know, he's saying one thing, uh, thinking that the palace should be correcting narratives, when he himself has taken two years to correct a huge narrative, which obviously will have hurt members of the royal family. So, I think maybe Harry needs to look at that as well, practising what you preach. Okay, so Harry's just said that obviously he's open to coming to the coronation, but the, the point of recording this, he he has not indicated that he's actually been invited. He says the Netflix and the book were retrospective project, projects, which is why, um, you know, it's it's all been about looking back on his life and not looking forward. Although... I can kind of think that for the past, you know, two to three years, it does seem like all they have done is look back. There doesn't seem to be a lot of looking forward. And he describes them as being essential. Um, I don't think it's essential. I think it's a choice about what you put out. They could have just carried on with life and tried to sort out these things privately behind the scenes, whether it worked or not. Um, but they could have just, they didn't have to do this, basically. OK, so Harry has kind of ended the interview by um, saying how happy he is, how safe he feels now that he's left the UK, how he is open for reconciliation, how he finds it difficult to come back to the UK, but he's in a really good headspace to not let um, what would have brought, brought him down continue to do so. A lot of people, to wrap up and to summarise, a lot of people are going to have very varying and differences of opinions from this. Um, a lot of people are going to say that it does look and appear like he's constantly looking back, like he does have um, a massive uh, issue with the press and that that issue he has allowed to affect um, his relationship with his family. I think he feels that his family should have the same opinion and stance that he does uh, with the institution. Now, of course, it's easier for him to operate um, how he's doing now outside of the institution. But for those still in the institution, having that symbiotic relationship is still very, very important. And I would probably say the best way of dealing with it. It's a bit of give, it's a bit of take to kind of get that result. Um, I would say that I think William and Catherine are actually negotiating uh, their family life, the role of being parents, now the role of being Prince and Princess of Wales, really, really well. Their children... The, Cambridge, the, the, the Wales children now, um, are largely growing up in private. We, you know, we, as, as a British public, as a global public, we see them growing up, we're seeing them evolve, but we don't know about their day-to-day -day private activities. So I think the deals, at least, that William and Catherine have done with the media are holding and are kind of working in their favour. They have got a very different position, for example, to now... Uh, what Harry has put himself and Meghan and their children in. So it's horses for courses and I think everyone's going to have their own opinions on this interview. Please leave a comment down below and let me know exactly what you think. I will return uh, tomorrow with another video tackling some of the stories. For example, the seal story, the singing to seals. Um, I really want to tackle that one. So if you've enjoyed this video, please give it a big old thumbs up. Don't forget to share on social media. And of course, do hit the bell so that you know whenever I upload a new video. So from me to you all and goodbye.